The First World War arguably changed the world more than any event in history. All of them are in a landscape, in a scenario that was literally unimaginable to almost everybody on Earth just months earlier. To not fight after 1916, to not be conscripted, to be a draft dodger, was illegal. Hello, sir. Sir, welcome to the roster. Stop looking squeamish. You look like an imposter. You're here to fight in your country's name. Fight for a cause you barely claim. Fight for men you don't even know. Fight for decisions not made slow, made quick and hasty by men on show. Smart men from places smart men grow. You're a cog in a machine of power and might. God, you're so lucky to fight. This cause is great and strong and right. And if you die when you see that light, oh, how lucky I've been, you'll say. I wish I could die every day. For my country and its wishes, more important than mine, my leaders, so rational and so kind. Oh, how I wish I could be you, living a life so sacrificial and true. On the front line, with your friends, defending your country until the end. What, what if I don't want to die, sir? What if it's not a cause in, in which I care? What if there were dreams I had to become a craftsman, a writer, a dad? What if I think war is a tad? No, not for me. Not for you! Aren't you a patriot, fool? Those people are here to kill you too! Your family! Everyone you love! If not for you, then the God above! You're not wise to question these thoughts made by barons, MPs and lords. Simple men should keep in line. Don't ask questions with your simple mind. Tell me. If not, for your country and the crown? If not for your compatriots that you're so eager to let down, what would you die for? What would I die for? Nothing. Dying for a country, what does that mean? To give your life up for, for something that you know is not black and white? It's hard to agree to that. I see myself as a citizen of the world, yeah, I feel like I give my life for ideals. What would I die for? How do I answer that question? Can it be nothing? Would you die for decisions not made by you? So many men, so many lives froze. 16 million people left to decompose. billion letters sent, many never able to reply, all because they had to die. Your letter of the 13th may come to hand today. I want to sympathize with you on your great loss. I was with your boy when he passed into the great beyond. Boys, barely men. A million from the Empire gone. Fight! Say the Ivory Tower men. The battle must be won! If I don't die, will I not be free? And I get to die in such luxury? Rats and lice and blood and flesh. Oh, take me now, I say. In jest. I don't want to die for you. You have no choice. You're going to. How did your perception of World War I change from starting the film to finishing it? Well, I guess I've been mean, listening to the audio as I was surprised at how little self-pity these guys had or they didn't consider themselves victims. I mean, they're not asking for our pity. 
I mean, sure, we sent them to the industrial mincing machine. You know, it obviously affected a lot of lives, but they don't, they don't, they're pragmatic. The battle begins and our men fall like maggots. The bullets and cannonballs come down like snow. You know, growing up at school, learning about World War I, I never learnt about the role of ethnic minority soldiers during the war, even though there were more than four million non-white men recruited during that time between 1914 and 1918. War poetry is one of the main kind of like remnants, I guess, of the soldiers' experience. And you think about people like Wilfred Owen or Siegfried Sassoon, but the stories of brown and black soldiers don't really feed into that. Feelings don't mean nothing From what I've seen in theatres of destruction But these scenes aren't scripted Nah, it was a con, that's why we were conscripted if When people watch films about World War I There are not many brown or black faces And the fact that people fought for Britain As essentially slaves in their own country And fought for their colonisers To me is something that people, I feel need to know and if people did know that they'd feel a certain way some people may feel proud about that some people may feel disgusted and angry long time arguments on a new street but we still get lost and we still can't see how we still keep talking about the same old things essentially looks at the uh, suffragette movement and the feminist movement of today and of yesterday and how I feel that uh, so many of the conversations we have now have been repeated for hun for decades and decades and decades. A lot of my frustrations with the feminist movement now, I was not surprised, but it was uh, quite depressing to realise that a lot of the things I'd say about feminism now, and the feminist movement, I should say, were being said a hundred years ago. I'm a historian and I'm a broadcaster, and I've been helping 1418 now to think about the history. Nobody had conceived that a war like that could possibly have happened. No one in 1913 could have imagined the Western Front. No one even in the summer of 1914 could have imagined the war that was about to be unleashed. All of them are in a landscape, in a scenario that was literally unimaginable to almost everybody on earth just months earlier. 